we will now turn our hearts and our ears to the message today. And I will read the first scripture. It is found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17 through 23. And I didn't bring my glasses up here, so I'm going to do the screen. Because <laughs> I can't read this. If you invoke as father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defeat, uh, excuse me, without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love. Love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. I'm very glad to have the opportunity to be back with you once again. Our second scripture, uh, which is not in the bulletin, is from the 24th chapter of Luke's Gospel. And I'll be reading from the Message Translation. Some of you may be familiar with it. It's uh, translated by a man named Eugene Peterson, who was a Presbyterian pastor in Maryland, my home state and then was also a professor of biblical languages and he's translated the entire Bible but I will uh, I will be reading from his version of Matthew I'm sorry Luke chapter 24 we don't have anything on the screen I believe would you raise your hand please if you if you cannot hear me at this pitch okay looks like we're all right This takes place on the day of Jesus' resurrection. That same day, two of them were walking to the village Emmaus, about seven miles out of Jerusalem. They were deep in conversation, going over all these things that had happened. In the middle of their talk and questions, Jesus came up and walked along with them, but they were not able to recognize who he was. He asked, What's this you're discussing so intently as you walk along? They just stood there, long-faced, like they had lost their best friend. Then one of them, his name was Cleopas, said, are you, are you the only one in Jerusalem who hasn't heard what happened during the last few days? He said, what has happened? They said, the things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene. He was a man of God, a prophet, dynamic in work and word, blessed by both God and the people. Then our high priests and leaders betrayed him, got him sentenced to death, and crucified him. And we had our hopes up that he was the one, the one about to deliver Israel. And it is now the third day since it happened but now, some of our women have completely confused us. Early this morning, they were at the tomb and couldn't find his body. They came back with the story that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of our friends went off to the tomb to check and found it empty, just as the women said. But they didn't see Jesus. Then he said to them, So thick-headed! So slow-hearted, why can't you simply believe all that the prophets said? Don't you see that these things had to happen, that the Messiah had to suffer, and only then enter into his glory? Then he started at the beginning with the books of Moses 
and went on through all the prophets, pointing out everything in the scriptures that referred to him. They came to the edge of the village where they were headed. He acted as if he were going on, but they pressed him, stay and have supper with us. It's nearly evening, the day is done. So he went in with them. And here is what happened. He sat down at the table with them, taking the bread. He blessed and broke and gave it to them. At that moment, open-eyed, wide-eyed, they recognized him. And then he disappeared. Back and forth they talked. Didn't we feel on fire as he conversed with us on the road, as he opened up the scriptures for us? They didn't waste a minute. They were up and on their way back to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and their friends gathered together, talking away. It's really happened. The master has been raised up. Simon saw him. Then the two went over everything that happened on the road and how they recognized him when he broke the bread. What you have just heard is one of history's most powerful personal encounters. It's a factual account, probably told to Luke, the gospel writer, by those who experienced it, the eyewitnesses themselves. The action centers on a single word, one of the most thrilling and valuable words in our vocabulary. And that word is recognize. These two disheartened, disillusioned disciples did not recognize. And then finally they did recognize the risen Jesus. Recognition is a dominant theme all throughout Luke's gospel. And here in this account, recognition happens in two powerful ways. Through the opening of the word and through the breaking of bread. I trust that we can say the same when we gather here or elsewhere for communion on Sunday morning. That God is revealing himself through the opening of the word and also through the breaking of bread. Both of these, the scriptures and the table, become places of encounter with Jesus Christ. And both the scriptures and the table, word and sacrament, both point to Jesus' suffering. Let's look at how all this unfolded. Here are two disciples of Jesus. They're not two of the inner circle of twelve, but they're followers of Jesus and probably have been for some time. Were they two men? Or were they Cleopas and his wife? John, in his gospel, mentions Mary, the wife of Clopas, at the cross. Perhaps it is she. They're walking to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles outside of Jerusalem. It's Easter afternoon, but it's not an Easter for them. They're disheartened. They're disillusioned. They're, they're heartbroken. And they are so deep in conversation that they don't even notice another traveler who comes up behind them on the road. And once they do notice, they don't recognize who that traveler is. Luke says their eyes were kept from recognizing him. But he speaks up. What, what is it you're discussing? And they stop and look at him. Are, are you the only one in Jerusalem who hasn't heard what's What's happened there the last few days? And the stranger says, what things? The things that, listen to, listen to their answer. The things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene. He was a man of God, a prophet, dynamic in work and word, blessed by both God and all the people. Now, that is high praise. That is a strong commendation. Who of us would not envy that kind of a reputation? But for Jesus, it's inadequate. It hardly begins to describe who he really was and is. And yet, 
It is the most that can be said of Jesus by those who do not believe in his resurrection. If we regard the resurrection as fake news, then we don't have anything really to say. Listen again to what they said. A, a man of God, a dynamic prophet, well, that is the most that Jesus can be to those who do not believe that he's risen. And for these two disheartened disciples on the road, Jesus' death spelled the end. That was it. And the reports of an empty tomb, that spelled only confusion and imagination. But we had hoped, past tense, that he was the one. The one about to deliver Israel. How sad. What should have been for them the day of hope realized was instead the day of hope extinguished. Well, it's at this point in the encounter that things take a surprising turn. For their explanation and their expression of lost hope don't draw any sympathy at all from this mysterious stranger. But instead, they get a sharp rebuke. So thick-headed, he says. So slow-hearted. Another version has it, how, how dull you are. Whatever the expression, it's far from a compliment. It shows that they had done less than expected at working with the biblical testimony to see all that it said about the Messiah. No doubt they knew quite well the prophecies of the Messiah's glory, but they had glossed over the prophecies of his suffering. For centuries, God's people had found in the scriptures the prediction of the glory of the future Messiah and of his victorious rule. They had seized on that, but they had somehow overlooked or passed by or discounted the shadow side, the painful part of the Messiah's mission. And yet, it was there, is there, in the prophecies all throughout the scriptures. And so the stranger opened for them the significance of those references to himself in all the sacred writings. Now we're not told what passages he referred to, but surely it included the words of the prophet Isaiah, who spoke seven centuries earlier of God's suffering servant. Here, for example, is some of what Isaiah said and wrote in chapter 53. Let me read for you verses 3 through 6. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Then in verses 11 and 12, the prophet speaks about the glory of the Messiah. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. What a Bible study that must have been there on the road. Well, the miles flew by, and soon they had reached their destination, Emmaus. 
We don't know whether it was an inn or perhaps their own home. Whichever it was, they invite Jesus to stay, for the hour is late. Stay with us, for the hour is late. That, by the way, is the root and basis of a hymn that I think we all know and love. Abide with me, fast falls the eventide. This is where it's rooted in this story. And there at the supper table, the stranger is asked as a courtesy to be the one to bless and break the bread. And as he does, their eyes are opened and they recognize the living, resurrected Jesus in their midst. Don't you suppose it was the marks in his hands or the sound of his voice? We don't know. We're not told those details. But in that glimpse, that instant, that, that crack between heaven and earth, they see God. And then he's gone. Cleopas and Mary look at each other and exclaim, Weren't our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road? Opened the scriptures up to us? Then the hearts that had been broken became hearts that burned. The eyes that were blind to Christ's presence became eyes that could see. At once they were on their feet and were hurrying back to Jerusalem with the news that Jesus is alive. And as they share their news with the, with the eleven disciples, Jesus again came and stood among them for all to see. Now I have a question I want to pose to us. How often does the risen, unrecognized Christ walk alongside us, among us, behind us, before us, as we go our own important, preoccupied way? Quite often, I believe. I believe, too, that often he is present to us in, in what may be called distressing disguise that is through our own sufferings or through the sufferings of someone else through experiences that show us our need or that of someone else and still the risen Jesus desires to enter in wherever and whenever he is invited why is it then that Jesus is not recognized and worshiped and followed by more people in our day? Well, for some people, it's because they have not heard the gospel. The, they have not heard the good news that God has personally visited this planet and given his own life for our salvation and risen again. Others do not recognize the real Jesus because they're stuck with only sentimental notions of Jesus and of a grandfatherly God who supposedly overlooks and excuses all wrongdoing. That's an illusion. But still others, many, many others, do not recognize and believe in the real risen Christ because they, like the early disciples, are looking for a different deliverer. One who will free them from all pain shield them from all suffering, rid the world of all evil and calamity. And that too is an illusion. That will happen in God's providence. And you and I are to work and pray to bring about an alleviation to these ills and evils insofar as we are able in this life. But it will not happen in fullness not before our Lord's final return. Meanwhile, it will involve continued hardship and suffering, sacrifice and service, knowing that he is with us, even in the valley of the shadow of death. Christ calls us, calls all of us, to look for him, to recognize him, and to encounter him in those places and circumstances where he is pleased to reveal himself, where he waits to encounter us. 
in the Scriptures. That's one. Not only as we read those favorite verses that speak of His mercy and kindness, but also as we need and take to heart, as we read and take to heart those words that warn us about sin, that show us our need, that speak of Christ's suffering and dying to bring us home to the Father. The second place where He waits to encounter us is at His table, in the breaking of bread. Not just as a lovely ritual, not as a snack, not as an add-on to Sunday worship, but as spiritual food as a costly communion with one another in the body and blood of our crucified Savior. As the Apostle Paul reminds us, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. But Christ also waits to be recognized not just in the word and not just at the sacred table, but he waits also to be recognized and encountered in and through our neighbor, the person in need of help, the one who's often overlooked or bad-tempered or avoided or who is rejected or lost. How easy it is to fail to recognize Jesus in such distressing disguise as that and to miss those encounters altogether. The family had gone to the movies. Dad handed everyone their own ticket, and on their way past the refreshment stand, the young son stopped to get some popcorn. The rest of the family, thinking they were still all together, went in and sat down. By the time the boy got into the theater, the lights were already dim. He scanned the faces, and he, he couldn't find his people. He began to race up and down the aisles, searching the crowd in the near darkness. Finally, as the lights began to go down even further, he stopped and called out loud, Does anyone recognize me? All of us, of course, seek to be found, yearn to be recognized long to be reunited and received. And so too does our Savior, Jesus Christ. Although he is not anxious, as we are, and although he always sees and knows precisely where we are, he moves up and down the aisles of our lives, calling to us in our darkness, I'm here. Do you recognize me? May we seek him earnestly through the scriptures, at his table, and in our neighbor, so that he may show us what we need to understand, so that he may tell us what we need to hear, so that he may nourish and sustain us, so that we and those we serve might know the joy of recognition. Amen.